A practical example of the use of the maritime jurisdiction by the lawyers and theirmins. It should be becoming apparent to the reader what is really going on in the federal and state courts when one is charged with a penal offense, and it should be apparent that penal is not the same as criminal. Take the issuance of a traffic ticket for example. The lawyer's minion, the police officer, goes out on the public rights of way to solicit business for his master, the prosecuting attorney for the city of corruption or the county of tyranny, both of which are corporate instrumentalities of the state of confusion. This solicitation of business for the lawyer by the police officer is called champerty.4 champerty is, or at least used to be, a tort and a crime at common law. The police officer lurks around and finds someone violating a traffic regulation, let's say for driving an unregistered motor vehicle, arrests him, and issues a citation on the presumption that the offender is bound in some undisclosed manner to the maritime jurisdiction, a presumption probably created by the existence of the state driver license, or on the presumption that the state has acquired an interest in the motor vehicle being driven by the offender, or on the presumption that the state has an interest in the offender himself. On threat of imprisonment, the cop forces the offender to sign a citation as a promise to appear in a certain court at a certain time. This citation is a contract to compel specific performance. The cop signed and the offender signed. It looks like a legitimate contract, except for a couple of problems. The first problem is that it was signed under a threat. That alone should be enough to void the contract. The second problem is that the cop did not pay any consideration to the offender to perform. Want of consideration is always a defense under the Texas Business and Commerce Code, same as the UCC, Sector 3.408, unless there is an underlying or antecedent obligation, and there is no evidence of an antecedent obligation, but it is presumed. A third problem is the unconscionability of the contract. The authors will not discuss unconscionability 5 here, except to say that it is unconscionable to force someone to contract under threat, coercion, or duress and unconscionability can be grounds to void a contract. If the offender does not sign the citation, the cop, exercising the quasi in rem maritime jurisdiction, seizes the offender, in his ends legis 6 capacity, and usually the motor vehicle which are merely things under maritime law and throws the for black six, the secret of the offender in jail, warehouse, without the need of a warrant. The offender is eventually brought before some magistrate to enter a plea in a court of maritime jurisdiction and the only issue before the court is whether or not the motor vehicle was registered. When the offender identifies himself by admitting his name and enters a plea, the quasi in rem action automatically converts to a maritime personum action, in which the real man is held liable for actions of the property in which the state claims a priority interest and the offender has become the defendant. Adherence to the constitutional requirements for due process are not required in the maritime jurisdiction because of the presumption that the offender agreed to be abused in this manner when he signed the presumed maritime contract or granted the presumed interest in the ens legis or the motor vehicle, or both. This is the same situation Cadet Custer found himself in, on the presumption that he had signed the Articles of War, he was subject to the penalties prescribed by them. Custer avoided the sentence because he shifted the burden of proof by challenging the subject matter jurisdiction of the court-martial. In the instances of our traffic violation and Custer's court-martial, the onus prop Andy 7 has been thrown on the defendant. He is put into the unenviable position of proving that he did not commit the offense. He is put into the position of proving a negative, which is usually an impossibility, and he is going to pay the penal sum required by the contract. He is guilty until proven innocent. The defendant's remedy, if he has one, is to shift the burden of proof or onus probandi to the state's lawyer, the prosecutor. He can do this by challenging the jurisdiction of the subject matter and by challenging the presumptions by admitting evidence to the contrary. The subject matter is merely the facts of the case. Facts must be properly admitted into evidence according to the rules of court. If there are no facts in evidence, there is no subject matter. If there is no subject matter, there is no subject matter jurisdiction and the only action the court can take is to dismiss the claim.
the court may not inquire into the controversies between the parties until such time as the subject matter jurisdiction has been properly invoked by the parties. The subject matter jurisdiction of a court is not prima facie. The Supreme Court has held that a man must assign a good reason for coming to the court. If the fact is denied, upon which he grounds his right to come into the court, he, the secret, must prove it. He, therefore, is the actor in the proof, and, consequently, he has no right, where the point is contested, to throw the onus prop ante on the defendant. Maxfield's Lessee v. Levy, 4 U.S. 330. Emphasis added. Now the question arises, how is the defendant going to shift the burden of proof? Maybe he should admit some facts into evidence denying the presumptions and follow the court's rules of evidence when he does it. Maybe he should challenge the subject matter jurisdiction of the court. Maybe he should demand some discovery by demanding the prosecutor bring the contract or other obligation into court and properly admit it into evidence, and follow the court's rules of discovery when he demands the production of the documents. Maybe the defendant could shift this burden of proof by admitting a simple affidavit into evidence of the case stating that the defendant denies that he signed any contract or other obligation that binds him to the maritime or admiralty jurisdiction. That the defendant did not convey any interest, right, or title of his car or himself to the state. If these facts are properly admitted into evidence, the burden of proof is shifted to the prosecutor to prove the existence of the contract or other obligation by admitting the original into evidence, and this must be done by the real party in interest, whoever it is. If, on being unable or unwilling to admit the contract or other obligation into evidence, the prosecutor refuses to withdraw the claim and the judge refuses to dismiss the case they will be proceeding without subject matter jurisdiction. With no subject matter jurisdiction they have no official or judicial immunity. The courts have held. When a judge knows that he lacks jurisdiction, or acts in the face of clearly valid statutes expressly depriving him of jurisdiction, judicial immunity is lost. Rankin v. Howard, 1980, 633 F.2 D. 844, Cert. Den. Zeller v. Rankin, 101 S.C.T. 2020, 451 U.S. 939, 68 L.Ed. 2 D. 326. A judge must be acting within his jurisdiction as to subject matter and person, to be entitled to immunity from civil action for his acts. Davis v. Burris, 51 Arizona 220, 75 P.2 D. 689, 1938. When a judicial officer acts entirely without jurisdiction or without compliance with jurisdiction requisites he may be held civilly liable for abuse of process even though his act involved a decision made in good faith, that he had jurisdiction. Little v. U.S. Fidelity and Guarantee Co., 217 Miss 576, 64 so. 2D 697. The secret of the no judicial process, whatever form it may assume, can have any lawful authority outside of the limits of the jurisdiction of the court or judge by whom it is issued, and an attempt to enforce it beyond these boundaries is nothing less than lawless violence. Abelman v. Booth, 21 Howard 506, 1859. We, judges, have no more right to decline the exercise of jurisdiction which is given, than to usurp that which is not given. The one or the other would be treason to the Constitution. Cohen v. Virginia, 1821, 6 wheat. 264 and U.S. v. Will, 499 U.S. 200. Maybe if the court refuses to back off the defendant should demand that the judge take mandatory judicial notice of the above cases and similar cases. If the court still does not back off and worse comes to worse, the defendant should raise the issue of subject matter jurisdiction after trial and before sentencing at allocution. Allocution must be demanded before sentencing or the right is presumed waived. If the rats still don't back off the defendant can make a direct appeal to the appellate court and onto the Supreme Court of the United States, he can file petitions for the writ of habeas corpus, 
he can sue the perpetrators, i.e., the cop for champerty, the lawyer for baratredi and bringing a case with unclean hands, the judge for lack of jurisdiction, and all of them for conspiracy to fraudulently conceal the true nature and cause of the accusation, and maybe even for RICO. It is never too late to challenge subject matter jurisdiction. It ain't over until the defendant gives up. The courts have held and the rules reveal that subject matter jurisdiction cannot be waived by parties, conferred by consent, or ignored by court. Babcock and Wilson v. Parsons Corp., 430 F.2D 531, 1970. Subject matter jurisdiction may not be waived and courts may raise the issue SUA Spont FRCP, Rule 12, H. Lack of subject matter jurisdiction is a defense that is never waived. FRCP, Rule 12, H, 3. Subject matter jurisdiction can never be waived and can be raised at any time, even after trial. Zenith Radio Corp v Matsushita Elec. Industrico, Ltd. 494F. Sup. 1161, DCPA, 1980. Lack of subject matter jurisdiction is not waivable and can even be raised on appeal after judgment on the merits. Monaco v. Carey Canadian Mines, Ltd., 514F. Sup. 357, D.C., P.A., 1981. The secret of judgment of court lacking jurisdiction is void. Burnham v. Superior Court of California, County of Marin, 110 S.C.T. 2105, 1990. Many patriots have discovered that the flag in the courtroom is a gold-fringed maritime or admiralty flag. Extensive research has been done on the subject. The research indicates that there can be no doubt that the court displays a maritime flag. So what? It is obvious the court is a court of maritime jurisdiction enforcing maritime contracts. Many patriots have gone to jail challenging the jurisdiction of the maritime flag. Hindsight is 20 twentieths, but they should have been challenging the subject matter jurisdiction of the court. They should have been rebutting the presumption of the contract and shifting the burden of proof.